All right, good afternoon, British and American culture class. Uh, happy Chusak, everybody. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your holiday. Uh, this is Wednesday's lecture, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to attempt uh, something unprecedented. Uh, we're going to try and get through chapter one <clears throat> in one week. Um, I say that it's never been done before because it, <clears throat> usually, as I told you, we never get to chapter eight, but it's one of my primary goals this semester to actually complete the book. So uh, let me say something about the class, which I didn't mention uh, in the orientation or the first lecture. Uh, it's a very ambitious topic, British and American culture. So uh, I did mention that I have to pick and choose uh, this is m not really supposed to be like an in-depth uh, examination of either culture, but more of an overview. Uh, but even then, is in, in some cases, it's just more like a sampling of certain parts of uh, British and American culture. So what we're doing today is uh, exactly that. I'm going to go, I'm going to blitz through the entire first thousand year history of of um, Great Britain, what what people imagine uh, is the beginning of Great Britain. Uh, Celtic Britain um, didn't really form into something tangible for most uh, historians or um, most people who study British culture because nothing was written down. Of course, Celtic um, culture is very influential, but it's more influential um, to certain parts of Britain, not so much to England. Um, and we are going to be focusing primarily on England um, rather than the other regions of the United Kingdom, uh, Wales, Scotland, and uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, so as I said, we talked about the Celtic culture last Wednesday. Um, so that is the starting point. The Britons, um, uh, the, the name Britain comes from Britannia, which is uh, a Roman name. So we're going to start with the Romans and we're going to go through these four cultures that um, conquered, invaded, merged, uh, transformed um, the, the island, um, uh, which was known before uh, as Albion. Um, but we just really refer to it as Britain now, uh, as I said. So um, we're going we're gonna to just talk about the cultures in a broad sense today and um, on the second part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about um, individuals uh, who are important in the uh, development of the first millennial, uh, first millennium of British history. So we're talking approximately from 0 AD to approximately um, 1000 AD, but we'll go, we'll start a little bit before 0 AD and we'll end a little bit afterwards because the, the dates don't line up perfectly. So as I told you, the, the contact between the Romans uh, and the people of, of Britain, the Britons, the tribes that occupied the island, uh, that occurred when Julius Caesar decided to make an expedition across the English Channel because he thought that the, the Celtic people um, were uh, supporting the Gauls and the Belgiae, which he was at war with and had conquered. Um, and he was right about that. There was um, cultural connection, but there was an economic connection and political connection and religious connection between those cultures. And there was something going on there. To what extent it was making um, problems for the Romans, we don't really know. Um, but Julius Caesar, being the man that he was, uh, saw an opportunity to go to the edge of the world, as I said uh, at the end of the last lecture. I said it was almost like... Um, aliens meeting each other. Uh, just like we'll talk about later, we'll talk about how Columbus, you know, encountered native people in uh, the Americas. That, that contact, there have been tens of thousands of years without any contact, right? Um, in this case, we're talking, you know, um, a shorter amount of time uh, and a closer distance. So the English Channel, even though it was very, it's very um, narrow, like I've explained, and uh, your, our European students can, can attest to this, that um, it's really a very short um, hop from France to England. But 
it's a significant barrier. Um, in, in one sense, it's a significant barrier. In another sense, it's not. Um, let me explain what I mean by that. The distance is short, so you can get across um, easily. But as I explained, the weather and the wind um, often is problematic. So even though the distance is short, it's very difficult to get across. At the same time, the fastest way to move um, for thousands of years until you get trains and airplanes and automobiles um, within the last 200 years, the fastest way to go anywhere is water, right? So when you get to the Vikings, uh, the English Channel is not, the Vikings are not trying to cross the 20 kilometer distance of the English Channel or, or 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers. They're, they're going hundreds of kilometers in open sea. So it doesn't matter. Um, the entire area around um, England and uh, Scotland becomes the highway for the Vikings to access the island. It's almost worse, right? You'd rather have like mountains or rivers or, you know, dense forest like in Germany um, to as a barrier for invaders. But when the Vikings start exploring, trading, raiding, conquering parts of, of Europe, they start, they start with the British Isles. They start with Scotland and uh, England because that's the first stop. Um, and the, yeah, the, the ocean is their highway. So um, the rivers of England, geographically, uh, the reason that England was prosperous um, and was able to trade very um, easily with the continent and with within itself is because of these large rivers I mentioned in the last lecture too. Geographically, there's lots of rivers flowing sort of horizontally across England. Um, the, bit, the most important one being the one that Lin London is situated on, the, the Thames River. And there, there was lots of traffic going up and down that. Um, easy access for, for trading, also easy access for Vikings on longships. Um, so that's why the Romans built Londinium in that location. So let's talk about the Romans. Um, the, the, we can't underestimate, you know, the, the confrontation of cultures here. Um, but to a certain extent, the Romans having already conquered France, which was Gaul and Spain, which were Celtic people as well, meant that they were already sort of prepared um, for what the Britons might be like. They were, they were different, um, but, but there are some similarities. The way that they fought, um, the, what, what they looked like, they're, they're generally taller, um, lighter skinned, um, with lighter hair and lighter eyes, and they're very individualistic, especially when they fight. Um, politically, they're not unified, it's not an empire. So when the Romans came, they've got these squares, They've got legionnaires, they've got soldiers with shields and spears and, and the famous Roman short sword, the gladius, um, which is made of steel. They have armor and they're in lines and they're commanded in units um, um, of a hundred. The, the famous, um, the legionnaires are in a group of about 5,000, but centurions are the, the, the um, basically the, the sergeants and the commanders of the, you know, hundred man units of, of Romans. And famously, they are super disciplined. They follow orders. Their morale is very high. Um, they'll fight in formation. They won't, they won't run. They won't be intimidated um, just because there's, you, you might watch, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you on Friday. Um, the, the movie Gladiator, which now is quite old, um, but when I, was, when I was in university and you were children, uh, probably babies, this is around 1999, 2000 or so. Excuse me, my battery is running low. <clears throat> um, around that time, this movie was produced and um, um, there's, a, there's a scene um, between uh, the Roman legion legions fighting right at the, the opening scene of the movie is the Roman legions fighting against uh, German um, barbarians and <clears throat> you know I none of us were there um, they had to recreate this scene which I will show you um, but to a certain extent we know 
that that there's um, basically that's the way it 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 they fought. That's the way they were encountered. The the Romans built their walls. They set up their their spikes of you know sharpened wood and they dug in holes and they shot flaming arrows and they had they had catapults and siege engines and basically the celtic people and the germanic people were just big strong warriors um, and they shouted and and they banged their shields and they tried to intimidate and usually people ran away because they were incredibly um, talented and dangerous fighters but um, as a group uh, whether the Romans were bigger, stronger, individually better fighters or not, didn't matter because they just literally cut them to pieces um, because of the organization. They, the the um, Britons were not organized and, and there was uh, a lot of them, but they were not unified. They didn't have one leader. So usually, you know, it's the old Roman strategy of divide and conquer. They made made friends with some Britons um, they bribed some of them, they made promises to others, and then they fought the, the other tribes. Um, so one by one, fighting against the Roman legions, they never had a chance. So it wasn't long. Julius Caesar did his expedition and then he left. And then a hundred years later, the Romans came back with, like I said, siege, siege engines, armor, discipline, soldiers, commanders, uh, and they just crushed uh, tribe after tribe until they they ran up against Scotland, which um, geographically Scotland is uh, almost impossible to occupy. Um, the Romans tried to take it over. The Vikings tried to take over Scotland. Um, the English tried again and again to subdue Scotland and they were never able to do it. It's North Korea is is um, a good example of another place. It's it's all mountains and rivers and valleys. Um, and it's very easy for, you know, units and um, resistance to, to hide um, in the mountains and, and um, never really get under control. Um, Afghanistan is another famous um, place, which is filled with various types of terrain that are very difficult, deserts and river valleys and mountains, and you, you can't just... I mean, the American military, with all their technology, was able to control most of Afghanistan. But the, there was always, you know, resistance in certain parts of Afghanistan. And, and the, the British tried to take over Afghanistan and so on. I'm getting away from the, our current uh, topic, but that's, this is not a, a, a phenomenon that's unique to um, British culture. This happens all the time. Um, Scotland is one of those places that it is um, the terrain favors defense. Um, and the people that are used to living in that terrain uh, are almost impossible to control um, completely because they, they can maintain that resistance. So um, Roman uh, Britain only went up to basically where Scotland, uh, the border of Scotland and England is today. It's, it's almost a, a natural place to have a border between two countries. Um, only because of ec economics and um, politics did Scotland uh, decide on its own um, under pressure from England to unify and make the union that you know today, um, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, okay? So all of these features basically uh, have started with the occupation, right? The occupation of England by the Romans and them referring to the province as Britannia. Um, they have certain, it has certain features that um, remain consistent um, right up until the, the present day. So when the Romans conquer in the first century, when they conquer England, um, the religion is pagan. They have the Roman religion with Jupiter, right? Um, their religion, we're not gonna talk about it too much, but their religion is basically, you can remember the gods really easily because it's the name of the planets, right? You got Mercury and Venus and Gaia, which is Earth, and then you have Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and so on. Those are the gods of, of the Romans. Nike, everybody knows the shoes, um, everybody knows the brand. Nike was um, the Roman goddess of victory, right? And there was an altar of victory that was in Rome 
that symbolized their conquering of the world uh, as they knew it. And uh, they brought all of those uh, ideas to um, Britain, who, which had their own Celtic sort of shamanistic um, Druid religion, as I mentioned uh, last class. Um, their religion was completely different. It was very natural and spirit oriented. Uh, and the leaders, the, the religious leaders were called, um, they were called Druids. Unlike that, uh, Rome had a centralized um, institutional religion. Julius Caesar was the Pontificus Maximus, which is the religious leader in Rome. That was his title, uh, which he maintained that title for most of his life. Uh, and after Rome converted to Christianity, that, that, that position became the, the Pope. That's why we call, sometimes call the Pope the, the Pontiff, um, because of the Roman um, position for the pagan religion of Rome was Pontificus Maximus, right? The great leader of the uh, religion, the Roman religion. However, <clears throat> um, by the time that uh, the third century rolls around, um, Rome is starting to convert to Christianity. And this is one of the things that some people say leads to the, the end of the Roman Empire, but that's debatable. Uh, regardless, by the end, there are Roman Christians, but primarily uh, the influence, uh, religious influence on on uh, Britain, on England, uh, is very weak um, in terms of the original Roman religion and then the Christian religion. It never really gets a strong foothold. So when the Romans leave, um, Christianity leaves too. Uh, Latin is the language of the Romans. Of course, everything that is written and recorded about Britannia and about Britain for the first four centuries, all of that is, of course, written in Latin. Uh, I should put some dates here. We're just going to say it's about 400 years. It's not. It's more actually, it's closer to 300 years. But we're just going to say the Roman influence for the sake of simplicity um, goes from about 0 AD to 400 um, AD when they completely leave. Um, they have an emperor who lives in Rome and they have a, an entire legion that is stationed there. So there's 5,000 soldiers, which is plenty enough to maintain control of, of Britain. Um, the most important thing about the Roman influence is uh, the walls. I shouldn't say the walls. The architecture, the walls, the aqueducts, the roads, right? Um, I've made a list here. Roads, um, walls, architecture. Of course, um, nobody is writing and reading in Celtic Britain. So Roman Britain also brings reading and writing in the form of Latin. So that becomes uh, a, also a, a large influence and that's how we know a lot of information. Um, some of the most spectacular things you, you can see in England if you go and visit um, I, I highly recommend going to the city of Bath and it, it's called Bath because it was a Roman bath and and they you know there was a natural spring there which had some weird chemicals in it so the water is like really um, you know bright colored greenish strange greenish color and um, before the Romans got there they believed it was a magical you know gateway to another spiritual place and when the Romans built you know their Roman bath um, with the pillars and everything and the stairs and, and everything like they, they had in Italy, they built it on top of the spring. So the water, you know, um, comes up and you can, it's still there. The ruins of it are there. Um, and it's a really cool place to go, you really get a sense of, you know, some mystical, uh, cultural um, experience if you go there. Um, if you walk, if you walk around London, you can go to different places and the original city. So if you go to like downtown London, the original where original Londinium was, you can you can see pieces of like you can go down in the subway and you can see like a Roman wall on one side. On, on the other side, you'll see like concrete and plastic. And on the left side, you'll see like a piece of a Roman wall um, where the original city um, was built by the Romans. So. Uh, lots of things left over. It's like the, the original bones of the city are Roman. Um, so architecture, the Roman law, and Roman literature, that's, those are the, 
the, the great influences that the Romans had on the culture at which that were preserved even after they left to a certain extent. Um, but they did leave, and when they left, uh, of course, the people could take advantage of it. Uh, there were some Germanic tribes. Um, I will add the Jutes there because we always add them, but they were much less important than um, two uh, Germanic tribes called, <clears throat> or clans, um, called the Angles and the Saxons. And uh, Anglia, our, our German students will, will uh, um, <laughs> agree with me on this. Saxony, uh, to this day, uh, remains an important region in uh, Germany, just like Bavaria or another part of Germany, and Anglia, I think there's East Anglia and West Anglia, um, the, these people um, came over and then tried to reestablish Germanic kingdoms. Um, not, they didn't try, they did. Uh, the Romans were not there. The Britons, uh, once the protection of the Roman legions was gone, um, there was a power vacuum, and the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes filled that vacuum. Traditionally, um, the story is that they come in and they, they kind of roll through the countryside and wipe out everybody and kill everybody and replace them. But genetic evidence and historical evidence, archaeological evidence, has shown that that's not really the case. Um, there were a lot of um, male Britons that were killed, but there, were, uh, there was a lot of intermarrying. Um, the genetic evidence shows that almost all uh, English people are descended through their mothers um, to Celtic people. So um, a certain number of male um, Romano Britons or Britons fought against the invading Germanic people and they died and they were replaced. But, um, you know, the, the population wasn't wiped out at all. 90% um, of the population probably continued to exist and, and they, they merged. They, the, Britons, the Britons were absorbed and dominated. We talked about dominant, you know, counterculture and subculture. Basically, um, the, Anglo, the Anglo-Saxon culture became dominant. Uh, it wasn't a genetic or like re replacement of um, ethnic or racial, you know, um, domination. It was a cultural domination. So, just like when the Romans came, they didn't wipe out the Celtic people. Uh, the, the amount of people that were Italian or Roman in genetically was very small. But the, the people that um, converted and absorbed the Roman culture, they were effectively, you know, um, colonized. And they started behaving like Romans, even though they were descended uh, from Celtic people. So the same thing happens this becomes the dominant culture, and for, for hundreds of years, that's the way it is. Especially, we'll say, from 400 to 600 AD, that's when the invasions establish themselves, and the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms um, are, uh, start to form. And there ends up being seven, seven kingdoms. We call it the Heptarchy, which you don't have to remember, but there are seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Three... Uh, Angle kingdoms, three Saxon kingdoms, and one Jute kingdom, Kent, which is the, the kingdom that is closest to um, France and Germany. They also are pagan, but gradually they get converted uh, to Christianity by missionaries and by connections with uh, continental Europe. Um, they speak a language that is Germanic. Uh, English is a Germanic language, despite the way it sounds. Uh, that is one of the reasons why Germans tend to be able to um, pronounce uh, English much easier than other people is because we, um, the, the basic structure and the basic vocabulary of English is German. We're classified as a Germanic language, even though a lot of the vocabulary is not. <laughs> a lot of the vocabulary is Latin, French, Greek, uh, Italian, and other languages, but the, the basic parts of the language are Germanic. That's because Old, old English and Old German and Old Danish would have been much closer related. They branched off and developed in different ways, but that is where English comes from. It comes from the Anglo-Saxons. So they're the ones, that's why it's called English, because of Anglia, and um, Angeland, 
right? Angeland, as it was spelled, <clears throat> various spellings, of course, back then there was no dictionary and there's no spell check, but Angeland eventually becomes um, England, right? The land of the Angles. Um, don't ask me why the Saxons are not included. I don't know. Um, but the people are called Anglo-Saxon and the language is called English and the land is called Angle land. Um, they have chieftains and kings, which are um, just like any other country, but normally they have some sort of power sharing council, which means that um, the Germanic kings had less absolute power as opposed to later on um, other types of government they, where they, um, the kings really had nobody, they didn't have to um, have advisors or listen to anybody else. They could just um, just use their power, as we say, absolutely. They can just say things um, without consulting anybody else. Um, they, especially the Saxons, were famous for being pirates. So they did steal and attack um, people. They, they fought uh, usually on foot and they had shields uh, and, and axes and swords and spears and they would sort of stand their ground and make a wall with their shields and, and um, other um, armies would attack and they would repel them by standing their ground with, in, in this formation called a shield wall. Um, it's very famous, um, not just in England, but um, in certain battles um, they did the, this, this um, military strategy, uh, famously the Islamic uh, military, which conquered from all the way from West, at, well, they started in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, obviously, and they spread uh, across Northern Africa to Western Africa, it took over Spain, they, they went all the way to India in the East, um, took over Persia, took over Turkey, uh, one of the the most um, what powerful militaries and conquests in the history of the world, the Islamic conquests, um, they happened um, <clears throat> around this time, a little bit later, um, but they were stopped in France um, by by the shield wall, and you know. Nobody can really say um, if that was just the, the effect of the shield wall or was that maybe that was the, the limit of every military runs out of um, power and support at, at a certain, you know, point. Um, they, they always um, have a peak and then they start to decline in their in their power. And maybe that was just the natural limit. Like France was just too far away from the center of power of the of the Islamic um, Empire. But um, the shield wall was very effective. It was very effective against other um, Germanic tribes. It was very effective against um, the Latin armies. It was very effective against horsemen. And um, th so that was a feature of um, the Anglo-Saxons, that they would fight this way. Um, they had a group of elite warriors called the, the Huskarls. And the Huskarls were basically, that's what they were. They had shields. They were really tough fighters that used their shields to protect themselves, to avoid um, being run down by horses and by hitting, being hit by missiles. Uh, and they usually had axes or swords uh, for attacking. So the shield wall, Anglo-Saxon law is very famous uh, because that's the origin of English common law. Um, these laws were created during this time um, in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Uh, they started to... Also, I should add tax as well. They started to organize um, the kingdoms so that they could count people and they could um, create courts. So if there was um, problems between people and, and um, um, they created courts of law and they created a system of taxation so that they could, they, they're basically building a really primitive kind of government, right? They're, they have officials um, and they have sheriffs uh, they have regions called shires. Each shire has a sheriff um, and they tax people. And it's supposed to be, you know, um, a, a way of organizing society. And uh, many of these things, um, they go right back to 600 or 700 or 800 AD. 
Um, and these are Anglo-Saxon things. After these, you know, seeming everything stabilizes and you have these seven kingdoms, uh, a destabilizing thing happens, which is the Viking invasions. The Vikings start attacking somewhere around the 17th century. Um, the height of it is around 800 AD. So like the age of the Vikings, you might say, we'll just change this to 700 to make it a little bit uh, um, more, you know, neat in terms of numbers. Because I told you, I, I don't really expect you to remember numbers. But the Viking age, <clears throat> the age of the Vikings' uh, power and influence over um, Europe is the 8th century until the 11th century, right? Um, so for two or three hundred years, <clears throat> there's a constant threat of these sea pirates suddenly appearing out of nowhere. You never know when they're coming. They might come and attack your village or your town and then not come back for like 10 years. And so, But you just have to like be ready at any time for them to show up and attack. And that's, that is a kind of uh, difficult thing for uh, any people to deal with is like after like they attack and they burn stuff and they kill people and they steal things and they disappear uh, and then you're you're ready to fight them for a few years but after a while you start to relax and think all oh, the Vikings are not coming back and then they, they come back again. <clears throat> Sometimes they, they attack and pillage and burn and steal and kill and they leave and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they, they stay. So there are cities across um, northern England. York is one of the, I mean, York is the most famous one. Um, sometimes it's called the, the capital of northern England. Um, York is a, is a Viking city. Uh, the capital of Ireland, Dublin, is, was also established by Vikings as well. So you got London, which is a Roman established city. And then in the north, you have York which was um, a Viking um, settlement. So they were definitely not Christian. There's not very much about Vikings that you can say is um, related to Christian religion. They came, they came and attacked and they, they weren't, didn't have any interest in Christianity um, other than the fact that lots of Christian um, symbols, Christian uh, artifacts are made of gold which Vikings like gold, just like everybody else. So they, they loved to attack churches. Um, so they get the reputation of being sort of like devilish, you know, anti-Christian um, warriors, but really they're just, af they're just trying to get the money. And um, the, there was no banks. So a lot of the wealth of, of a, a town or city would be in the church, would be um, um, collected and and uh, used to make ornaments in the church but in some cases just stored in the church as a place that is safe because you don't expect um, people priests and monks and nuns to be stealing people's money so the the church was a safe place for people's wealth so there was lots of gold and silver plates uh, crucifixes and and um, sort of you know cultural artistic wealth which the, the Vikings wanted. So they would often uh, go straight to the church and attack it and steal everything. Um, we, they're often referred to the Danes because uh, Denmark was um, the capital of the Viking um, nations or, or kingdoms. Uh, but Norway, of course, was important and later Sweden would become dominant. But um, during this period, they usually refer to them as Norsemen. <clears throat> That's another the Norse, right? Uh, the Vikings, the Norse, the Danes, they're all the same people. Um, this is actually, I should have written this first. Um, the most common thing was to call them the Nor the men from the North, the Norsemen. So they caused all kinds of trouble. They had their own kings. Uh, they had leaders called Jarls, which would become the English um, title Earl. Um, they had these people called Thanes as well. There is a position, a high position, a high ranking person in a, in a Viking kingdom. They were famous for their navigation and their ships. They were also famous for the way that they fought, they fought in battle, um, sort of like a crazy, you know, blind um, rage. And they believed, um, they believed that when they died in battle, 
that they would go to a place called Valhalla. Um, so it was actually, you know, if, if they died fighting, that was actually good for their spirit and, and for their, their eternal, um, you know, they would go to heaven, essentially. Um, that would be a reward for fighting in battle. Uh, it's not that different than, again, um, how the Islamic people, when they, then when they fought, believing that um, to go on a whole, to make a holy war, to go on uh, jihad, I'm, I'm not, um, um, I, I don't know a lot of information about how that works, but essentially it's that the, we have the same sort of um, reward system in um, the Viking culture as you would in Islam or in, in uh, Christian religion too, um, when people went on crusade, they went on crusade and, and the crusade was basically the church saying, if you go on crusade, then your sins will be forgiven. The, the bad things that you've done in your life are forgiven and then you will go to heaven. The way that, the, the way that it works for the Vikings is they, they need to be fighting and if they're killed in battle, then the Valkyries will fly down and pick up their spirits and take them to heaven. That's how Valhalla the idea of the hollow works. So um, they were crazy in battle and, and fearless. Um, so they were a very scary group of people to fight. They appear out of nowhere. Um, they're going to take everything you have, possibly kill you. And they're, they're, they don't care if they die doing it. Um, so very uh, scary group to, to deal with. And this is not just something that the Britons... Um, the Anglo-Saxons had to deal with and the Scottish people, but people across Europe had to deal with it. Um, people in France and Spain, uh, in Germany, um, in the coastline, all the way to Jerusalem. People in Italy had to deal with the Vikings too. They went wherever there was water, um, the Vikings went for several hundred years. So that's what uh, their their influence also is linguistic. You can you can see it in the th. There's actually um, there's actually a character. There was a character called Thorn, which was part of the English language, which is not in the alphabet. And that's it looks like kind of like a weird shaped D or or a P. And it now it disappeared, and we just use th. But the the sound th remains the and th. The two, the aspirated and the, the vibrated sound that I'm making, that that's a Viking sound. That's a, that's a Danish, old Danish, um, sound. So you, when you, whenever you um, say the and them and those and thus and thou, those old-fashioned words in English, um, you're using uh, your your. That's the imprint of the Viking culture. That is a linguistic, you know, mark of the presence of the Vikings in um, British culture. So that's kind of interesting, I think. The pronouns especially, right? Like I said, they used to say, instead of you, they used to say thou, and that is speaking like a, um, Old Danish. That's speaking like a Viking. Um, after that, <clears throat> the Normans come and I'm going to talk about the Normans really briefly, but that's going to sort of um, carry over into week three. Um, the Normans, they come, suddenly make their presence felt in 1066. And this is, um, that is a date that you actually have to remember. Um, unlike other numbers, I'm going to insist that you remember 1066 because that is the date that the Anglo-Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons survive, the, the, the Viking culture becomes uh, sort of co-dominant, right? It never completely erases the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture because I'm going to talk about a certain person, uh, Alfred, King Alfred, who manages to stop the Viking invasions. Alfred is um, a king, an Anglo-Saxon king, and he's the one who maintains the Anglo-Saxon culture um, throughout the Viking, the age of the Vikings. So when the Normans come, there are still, the Anglo-Saxon Anglo culture is still there. It's influenced by the Vikings, and there's tension between Viking culture, Danish culture, and English culture, but the dominant culture is English. So when, when the Normans come, um, it's, it's a sort of a battle. 
who's going to be dominant? The Normans, the Anglo-Saxons, or the Danish, right? And uh, we'll talk about how that plays out. But the Normans end up winning that battle, so they become the new dominant culture in, in, in Britain. Um, I call them French Vikings because they come from Normandy. That's why they're called Normans. And the, the name is related to this Norseman. But they are sort of, they speak French, but their culture is still kind of, it's a hybrid culture between um, French culture and the emerging French culture and um, in Viking culture. So they, they look more like when they fight um, and, and um, they, they, when, they, when you see them, they look more like Vikings on horses. But when they speak, they are speaking French. So when they come, they are actually, they are Vikings who have horses and have become Christian. They've adopted the Christian religion. They're very militaristic, um, unlike Christianity at the beginning, which was a quite peaceful religion. They, they are very aggressive. They are very um, <clears throat> warlike. They're very warlike. They speak French. Um, the, the leader of the Normans is the Duke of Normandy. Um, he becomes the King of England, but we get the word Duke. It becomes imported from the Normans and they start using it. So, and they start building castles um, and they have a feudalistic system where everybody's supposed to work on the land near the castle and there's a lord in the castle and the relationship between the people is, you know, people, lord, duke, king. It's very hierarchical in that sense. It's like a pyramid with the king at the top, a very organized society, which um, Anglo-Saxon and Viking society is a little bit more uh, like a community of, you know, um, first among equals, where the king is sort of like a leader of everybody, but he's not, uh, it's not like a um, um, sort of pyramid structure. It's more like there's a, a group of people that are more important and then there's everybody else. It's a flatter system, um, a flatter society. And that brings us to the end of the lecture. I know I speak very quickly and there's a lot of information here, but hopefully the board, if you look at the board, you can see the main points. And in class, if you have any questions, you can ask. And of course, the chapter one includes a lot more detail, um, specific detail about what I'm talking about. So please read over chapter one. It also includes the, the great leaders and important people that I haven't talked about yet, but we'll do that on Friday. Um, this lecture will be the only one. I'm not going to split this into two parts. So on Friday, we'll talk about the important people um, from each culture, and that will make um, Friday's lecture a little bit shorter, I think. Um, and that'll be all the material that you need to know for the quiz. So read chapter one, um, watch this lecture, and you know, stop it if it's too long. Just take a break. Um, I know this, this one's running close to 45 minutes. Um, take a break and make some notes. Make sure you read the chapter one. And on Friday, um, we'll go over everything, including the important individuals of the first millennium in British culture. Okay? Well, thank you very much for listening. And like I said, I hope you're enjoying your holiday. And I'll, I'll see you next Friday in, in class as usual. Take care.